YouTube. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge found here on the internet. All right, today's video should be a fun one. Uh, it is titled Fast Food in the USSR, The History. So what we're going to be looking at here is I know this kind of happens later in the Soviet Union when you started to get uh, some decentralization in government and and things like that with things like um glasnost and perestroika and kind of the end of the ussr at the end and you saw the ussr adapt some western corporate models kind of in a way like you see here with with mcdonald's and it was an interesting kind of end uh, uh, part of the end of the cold war as if you're seeing american consumerism penetrate into the soviet union it's a pretty good indicator that the Cold War and what it was about is changing, and maybe it's going to be over here in a second. So I'm interested to go into more of this, and I'll try to add some thoughts, because this whole process is actually part of some history curriculums, and uh, as part of the as part of kind of the end of the Cold War and the spread of American consumerism and culture through consumerism. So I'm interested to look at this. Now, the channel for this is called NFKRZ, and I don't believe I have seen anything from them so i don't know exactly what the style is but um, i love seeing a new channel so we'll go ahead and check this out now if you like this original video go down below and you'll see a link to the original video if you like this give it a like subscribe view all that kind of stuff so you can support those guys um, as there's so many great content creators here on the internet if you haven't subbed to my channel definitely do that hit the notifications so you can come hang out with us and let's go ahead and get started fast food in the ussr coke what you are looking at right now is the line on the opening day of the second McDonald's restaurants in the Soviet Union. The line crossed around several city blocks, creating a few traffic jams and lasting at least a good 10 hours. On January 30th... Okay, let's go ahead and just consume what you just saw here. If you were waiting in line like that for anything, let alone a cheap hamburger that clamors so much more than what that looks like on the surface 1990 right end of the soviet union right it's coming to a close here these people clamming for a very american thing a hamburger from the biggest chain in the world by the way shout out to the uh soviet union model of mcdonald's where you got mcdonald's and then you still got soviet union flag coming out of there um it is showing the shift in i don't know what it is in culture that's happening globally in the soviet union 10 hour line to get a cheap american hamburger it's a big deal to thirst 1990 over 30,000 people visited the first fast food chain in moscow to try the mysterious capitalist food known as the burger fast food is something that most of us take for granted it's always been there and it always will be for russians and the soviets however that has not been the case the soviet union was a restricted country hidden behind the so-called iron curtain no western goods such as Iron Curtain, uh, the reference to that, if you don't know, is Winston Churchill, not long after World War II, accused Joseph Stalin of Soviet Union of creating an Iron Curtain in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Europe, which was creating basically a, a hard line border of now communist nations, um, now into Central Europe, that Joseph Stalin had agreed would be able to get free elections and end up being basically puppets of the Soviet Union, causing this divide, artificial divide. In, uh, in Europe. Clothes, vehicles, and food products were allowed to enter the country. Only certain members of the communist party elite or celebrities could get the good goodies of capitalism, such as jeans, Snickers bars, and burgers. Borglars, okay. <laughs> uh, the economy um, in the 80s of the Soviet Union was starting to be hard. Some people say a lot of that was due to their so much spending in trying to keep up with the space race and the nuclear arms race that the economy, the, the communist economy of the Soviet Union was only, only able to keep up with the Americans. So they started to uh, give more capitalistic type abilities in, in private ownership and, 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 and uh, corporations and stuff like that, still under very much a, a, a watchful guidance of the government. But that was starting to happen, and you can see some of the things that are starting to show up as these things that have had such mass success globally, again, like 
<laughs> what? Uh, uh, Western clothing brands like you saw with Adidas or some Borglars. And Coca-Cola as well. The history of fast food in the U- Do you know they say Coke is probably the largest and widest spread brand of anything in the world? Because you can find Coke in some of the deepest jungles, most remote jungles in the, in the world. Um, Coca-Cola is, I, I believe, the biggest just brand in the world. USSR started out from an argument between the then leader of the USSR Nikita Khrushchev and the US vice president at the time which was Richard Nixon. In 1959, during a Soviet-held exhibition in New York, Nixon and a Pepsi executive, Donald M. Kendall, offered the Soviet leader to try some Pepsi. Reportedly, Khrushchev and Nixon got into a heated debate about which is better, communism or capitalism. During this argument, the Pepsi executive Donald M. Kendall came over to Khrushchev and offered them a cup of Pepsi. Khrushchev actually liked the strange black fizzy drink. The Soviet citizens therefore... And that was the beginning. You get him to drink some Pepsi, it just opens the crack. <laughs> now, uh, Nikita Khrushchev um, did a process called de-Stalinization, which was... Stalin, I mean, inarguably, was, was uh, a, a, a very hands-on, totalitarian kind of type ruler. And uh, when he died, few mourned in a lot of ways, uh, especially when it came to the influence of the government. And Khrushchev began a de-Stalinization process, which is they kept, of course, the he's he's a hardcore communist, um, uh, uh, Khrushchev, but did think it the government had to be the way necessarily that Stalin did, as as that uh, hard ruling quite that hard. So you did see slow elements throughout all of the years of the Soviet Union of loosening up a bit from. Um, Stalin, which really isn't saying much, because when it comes down to control, Stalin is about on the head of a list of very short people. But yeah, start, get the Pepsi in them, and then goes from there. ...became aware of what cola was, and Pepsi saw this as an opportunity to branch out to Soviet Russia. In 1972, PepsiCo has signed an agreement with the Soviet government to stop the sales of cola in the USSR. Due to the Soviet ruble being completely useless as a currency on the global markets and having almost no real value outside of the USSR because it was a closed country, a huge amount of Pepsi cola syrup was exchanged for an equal amount of Salichna vodka. <laughs> Okay, so you couldn't sell it to the Soviets because their money was worthless outside of um, Russia. So, yeah, trade it. So, sell Pepsi and go back. Where's the bottles? markets and having almost no real value outside of the USSR because it was a closed country, a huge amount of Pepsi cola. Okay, so you get the, the Soviet. It's not translated to Pepsi, I guess. You, you can't you can't sell it, so you just trade it for... The syrup was exchanged for an equal amount of Salichna vodka. Go for vodka, and then I guess the idea would be that you would sell that vodka, right? You have to go through another step if you're going to do any business with uh, the Soviet Union. Because, yeah, no, their money, and you can't use it anywhere else. <laughs> yes, yeah, seriously. In order to get Pepsi on the Russian shelves, the Soviets literally traded vodka for cola. This is, this is really not doing anything good for the stereotypes about Russians of vodka, is it? Well, the Stalichnaya vodka... Well, if they're giving it up for Pepsi, then yeah. ...became a big hit in the United States, and so did Pepsi in the USSR. Pepsi's cola syrup was exported from the United States to the USSR, where it was locally mass-produced using the syrup and sold under the Pepsi Cola branding. A decade later, in 1989, the initial agreement of the Soviet government with Pepsi was about to expire, and the USSR needed even more soda. What happened next is one of the most ridiculous and fascinating Jackson, things I've Cindy ever Crawford. heard. The Soviet government literally traded 17 submarines and three Soviet warships, including a frigate, a cruiser, and a destroyer, for three billion dollars worth of Pepsi. Yes, yeah, seriously. Why? and a destroyer for three billion dollars worth of Pepsi. But who? Yes. The government? Who Who else has just warships going around? For Pepsi? Seriously. This meant that for a brief moment in the 1980s, PepsiCo became the sixth largest military <laughs> in the world. Oh, so Pep... Okay, it was Pep... No, but who on the Soviet side had this? The government was doing that? Because that Pepsi had the sixth largest military in the world. Imagine if they use that. Like we're waging a war against Coca-Cola. This is this is insane. Okay, I just cannot comprehend this. Pepsi ended up selling all of the warships for scrap to some Norwegian or Swedish company. The story gets really shady here. I don't know. Honestly, I didn't find any good sources about this. So just trust wait, me. Wait, 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 wait. 
Okay, hold on. It gets really shady here. I don't know, honestly. I didn't find. Pepsi also brought new Soviet oil tankers and leased them out or sold them in partnership with a Norwegian company. They sold the fleet to a Swedish company for scrap recycling. Okay, so these these, these ships and stuff, they it sucked. They sucked. They were just used for, for recycling. Let's go back and get the whole context here. <laughs> I just cannot comprehend this. Pepsi ended up selling all of the warships for scrap to some Norwegian or Swedish company. The story gets really shady here. I don't know, honestly. I didn't find any good sources about this, so just trust me on this. And after this insane deal, Donald M. Kendall, which was the CEO of Pepsi at the time, famously said, that his company is disarming the Soviet <laughs> Union faster than the US governments. Another fun fact is that Pepsi also apparently launched a big ass Pepsi can into space near the Soviet Mir space station in the 1980s, and it was like a means of advertisement back in the day. 200 miles above the Earth's surface, it was lights, camera, action as Pepsi Cola, in conjunction with the Russian Mir space station, began production on the first ever television commercial shot in space. Jesus Christ, this is amazing. All these goods coming into the USSR, all the Western stuff, all of this was possible due to the last leader of the USSR, Mikhail Gorbachev, who ruled the country from 1985 up to its demise in 1991. Gorbachev is famous for creating the idea of glasnost and perestroika. This was a movement with the aim to reform the country's economy, to westernize the Soviet Union, remove the Iron Curtain, and to battle censorship. Um, Glasnost Perestroika, you probably learned about that. Five ...up to its demise in 1991. Gorbachev is famous for creating the idea of Glasnost and Perestroika. Uh, you definitely should have learned of these terms in your, your, your history classes. As these were policies that brought the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. Um, basically it's, it's opening up the government, becoming more transparent. Okay. And then also, um, uh... Getting rid of some of the bureaucracy of that and some decentralization happening here. And the idea with, with Gorbachev was kind of like, hey, we can we can like modernize the country and reform the country and the government specifically and censorship policies and that kind of stuff while still keeping maybe the core spirit of communism. Um, but what, what it kind of does too is it gives people a taste of a little bit more consumerism a little bit more personal freedoms in a lot of way. And what ends up happening is rather than just being, I guess, satisfied with that, the people are going to clamor for more. They're like, oh, this is what this is like. You know what I mean? To have more of these opportunities and that sort of thing and have more involvement. And it was kind of a band-aid, you know, with Gorbachev is putting on the Soviet Union when really it's, it's, it's kind of the beginning of the end. So putting a band-aid when the Soviet Union would have needed surgery to stay as a surgery. And this consumerism is definitely a part of this. This was a movement with the aim to reform the country's economy, to westernize the Soviet Union, remove the Iron Curtain, and to battle censorship. Gorbachev is a quite controversial figure in Russian politics. Some people praise him for promoting liberal ideas in a totalitarian country, while others claim that he sold the USSR out to the West, call him a traitor, and blame him for the destruction of the Soviet Union. By the way, as some more evidence of this, of, of Gorbachev, of people call, were calling him a sellout. Go ahead and look up Gorbachev's Pizza Hut commercial. It's in Russian. It's about Pizza Hut in uh, in uh, um, in Russia, and it's an ad for them. And he actually plays a little bit role in it. And it's kind of funny. Check it out. Look up just. Uh, Gorbachev Pizza Hut commercial. Check it out for sure. I showed my classes. Union. I really don't want to get into this because I don't want the comments to turn into war zone, okay? So I'm just gonna scoot by, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Gorbachev is actually closely connected to the opening of the first Pizza Hut in the USSR. Pizza Hut is owned by Pepsi, so opening a branch in the Soviet Union was quite easy. Gorbachev himself even appeared in an infamous okay. Soviet Pizza Hut advertisement. Oh, they are gonna show- okay, so this is what I was talking about. Maybe you don't have to go elsewhere. I doubt they're going to show the whole thing, because it's like a minute, minute and a half. There he is. That's Gorbachev. Gorbachev? That's because of him. We have в экономике бардак. Благодаря ему yeah, like old... у нас новые возможности. It's got the old school guy, maybe like the older guy from the, you know, the 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 earlier communist generation who lived through a lot of that stuff. And then you got the young guy, right? Because of him, we have opportunity. And by the way, this is totally how they felt about Gorbachev. He was a very split figure, just like they said. So yeah, it, it depended on what side you were. 
Это из-за него у нас политическая нестабильность. Да благодаря ему у нас свобода. Полный хаос. Перспективы. Политическая нестабильность. Да благодаря ему у нас есть писахат. За Горбачева! За Горбачева! За Горбачева! Sometimes nothing brings people together like a nice hot pizza from Pizza Hut. So you wonder if the old school people are then calling him a uh, a sellout for that. But I think it's such a one because it, it, it summarizes his 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 uh, leadership in a way. You got like the new young people who want to like move forward and get away from the old Soviet stuff, and then you got the old school guys. But pretty, it's a pretty brilliant ad. It really is. But it's like, hey, we can all agree on pizza is great though. We're glad we got pizza. <laughs> yeah, fam. I don't know that 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 one's gonna be a yikes from me. I'm sorry. Okay, that's gonna be a yikes from me. The agreement to open the first McDonald's in the USSR was signed in 1988, but the first restaurant did not open until 1990 at the Pushkinskaya Square in Moscow. I've actually been to this particular. Oh, just, I mean, think of the idea of this. If this had happened, even in Khrushchev's ears, okay. There's a McDonald's. Does anything represent American capitalism, right? More than McDonald's, really. I mean, if you're going to pick a brand that represents American consumerism and, and capitalism, whatever, lifestyle, it's McDonald's. It probably is. I think you can make a case at least. And you're sticking one of these right in downtown Moscow. Cold War is over. McDonald's. And it, you could see who won and who lost. And now it looks nothing like it did back then, but it's still pretty cool, I guess. So back then, in 1990, on the first day of the opening of McDonald's, over 30,000 people ate their burglar. This number still stays as an absolute worldwide record for the most people served in one day at a McDonald's. Even though the average salary of a Soviet worker was around 150 rubles back then, and only one burger cost about 1.5 rubles, for which you could buy like 8 or 9 loaves of bread, people of Moscow still rushed in to try the new serious western capitalist food it's amazing so i was wondering I, I was wondering a bit about how much it would cost like a regular person because i've been to mcdonald's some mcdonald's around the world or in, in other countries and it's still cheap like in a lot of places i know in some parts of the world it's actually more like high class um it depends mcdonald's business model changes to whatever it fits because you know there's some places you might not be able to undercut their food right the food process so make it a higher class thing or again go in somewhere where you need lower uh, uh cheaper food and then you can undercut stuff and then it can be cheap so i've seen them do that model but i was wondering if, if it was something that was cheap or expensive it looks like on this uh at this time it's actually more a little bit more on the expensive end but not unrealistic right it's just like going out for like a meat like going out for like a, a, a semi nice meal you know even if it's fast food style KFC in Russia has a very interesting history of new mysterious Western capitalist food. KFC in Russia has a very interesting history as well. It first opened up in Moscow in 1993, however it was not actually called Kentucky Fried Chicken. The KFC company partnered with a Russian company called Rosinter and the fast food chain opened up under the name Rostix. In 1998, KFC and Pizza Hut both left Russia because the business was not profitable. However, both of them returned to the Russian market in the year 2000s. KFC was still known as Rostix until 2005, when both companies decided to rename the brand Rostix KFC. Finally, only in 2011, KFC bought out the Russian branch and the KFC restaurants in Russia now have the original KFC brand name. Due to the chicken fast food chain being called differently for- Who holds- who holds it like that? Now have the original KFC brand name. Due to the chicken- who holds it like that? Is anybody down? Chicken fast food chain being called differently for such a long time, many people, especially of the older generation, still refer to KFC as Rostix. Subway first unsuccessful- I not eat it, Rostiffs. <laughs> uh, I don't know about you guys, this, this video is making me really hungry. <laughs>
fully tried coming to Russia in 1994, but they only managed to do so in 2004. Right now, Subway has the biggest amount of restaurants around Russia compared to any other fast food joints. Burger King was quite late to the party. Yeah, I mean, you can look at America, Subways are big because uh, it's actually very low cost uh, overhead for franchising comparable to like McDonald's. Um, it's not even close to, it's way cheaper to open like a Subway. People, people like it, right? The only opening up its first restaurant in Moscow in January 2010. However, <laughs> Wait, do we got we got Russian Colonel Sanders? Let's see. Only opening up its first restaurant in Moscow in January 2010. All right, what do we, what do we need to name the Russian Colonel Sanders? We need a uh, is it just like Comrade Sanders or something? Uh, maybe put your ideas. What, what do we need to call the Russian Colonel Sanders? However, today Burger King is perhaps the fastest growing fast food chain in all of Russia due to the company's aggressive marketing, which often comes off very cringy to be honest, and the fast food chain's great pricing policy. The American fast food chain Wendy's, Wendy's also there? tried to make it to Russia. The first joint was opened up in Moscow in 2011. However, Wendy's couldn't compete with the likes of McDonald's, Burger King, and KFC, and in 2014, Wendy's left Russia and closed all of its restaurants. It's a real shame because I never got to try it because I only went to Moscow for the oh, first time Russian. in 2015. Said that I- This guy is Russian, huh? Didn't get to eat spicy goodness like a boss. Jalapeno <laughs> fresco spicy chicken is so deliciously hot, it's generating reactions from everyone like the memer. Whoa! Oh, eat spicy goodness? Like a bow. Stop! Fucking stop! Other than that, <laughs> fast food chains that are present in Russia that need to be mentioned are Domino's, Shake Shack, Cars Jr., Hesburger, Dunkin' Donuts, TJ Fridays, and Papa John's. Okay, Unfortunately, Russia has no Taco Bell, Popeyes, In N Out, Chick fil A, Chipotle, or Five Guys. Yeah, those are yeah th those brands aren't big enough yet i cry every time in the late 90s russians started creating their own fast food joints for example the kroshka kartoshka chain which the kroshka kartoshka wait let's just look and see what they got here they got like baked potato sandwiches as various dishes based on potatoes with different toppings it was first opened in Ooh, i'd actually that sounds pretty good like a, like a like a potato restaurant, like a good baked potato restaurant. I, I could do that. I could do that. 1998 and is still active today. Another successful Russian fast food chain is Tirimok, which sells the traditional Russian dish known as blini, similar to crepes, with various fillings and toppings. Fun fact, Tirimok actually even had a number of restaurants in New York. However, they are no longer in business in the United States. The biggest and currently fastest growing oh, Russian cool. fast food chain is Dodo Pizza. It was opened up in 2011 and right now it's like the biggest pizzeria in all of Russia and it's actually pretty good. Apparently also recently they opened up a few joints in the United States and in China, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. And you know, it's great pizza. It's like they might go to basically at parties. This is not a paid advertisement. Is that Peter? The great. I'm just saying, okay, I'm just saying. It's okay. probably just because my city doesn't even have Pizza Hut. If we if had Pizza Hut, brah, I'd be on that. I'd be on that. So, I I'm hope you guys enjoyed this little history lesson on how fast food made its way into the Soviet Union and Russia. I Wait, look at the roof. Look at that. Is that just a design? Kind of interesting. Hope you guys enjoyed this little history lesson on how fast food made its way into the Soviet Union and Russia. I personally find these stories very entertaining. I mean, Jesus Christ, which other country leader ever took part in a fucking Pizza Hut commercial? I mean, we literally made Pepsi the sixth biggest military <laughs> in the world once. It's absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, if you guys did enjoy this video, please make sure to smash the like button on it and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. I'm trying to branch out a little more and do some essay type videos. If you guys want to support me as well, Make sure to check out my Patreon down in the description, that would be greatly appreciated. And yeah, thank you guys so much for watching this video, and I will see you guys in the next one. Cool. Peace. <laughs> Alright, cool. This That was awesome. I really liked that a lot, to hear some more of the history. I knew, just, but mostly what I had heard about this kind of thing was in the context of the... Um, of the Cold War, there's actually a term in our curriculum uh, that's it's called McDonaldization um, in the AP curriculum. That it's like it's like the spread of American culture through uh, businesses, like the spreading of American businesses, and thereby spreading American culture through American brands. They actually kind of call it McDonaldization because McDonald's was kind of the first of that. 
to really penetrate into these other uh, countries that the United States was culturally at war with, right? Like the Soviet Union is McDonald's kind of breaking that in. Um, actually, I mean, really, you should go to Pepsi. You'd think about it in, in a lot of ways there, but nothing had the effect. I mean, you saw um, the, like McDonald's and it's just the, it's just the fact that like, okay, you saw that, that opening day McDonald's were people waiting 10 hours. It's not because the food is just so good. It's worth waiting for 10 hours for like, that's not the thing. Nobody would do that. It's, 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 it's like this, like it's, it's the fad thing. I remember like, if you guys, have you ever had anything like this, maybe not 10 hours, but like, an in and out burger is now making its way into your state or something like that. You ever had anything like that? Popeyes, like some of the, the, the ones that are really starting to grow a little bit more like in America nationally. Um, and I always like when those kind of things open, you'll see that people want to be a part of the hype, right? That people want to be the heart of the hype because they want to be a part of the cool, progressive cultural thing that's happening. And in 1990, that's what that was in the Soviet Union to people. The cool progressive thing was some of this, again, like like American culture that was that was going on there. And you can see the shift of the population happening as a result of this and adopting these because it's more than just the food. It's about the experience and there, people like the idea of like being on the cutting edge of the new progressive cultural trend. People love that. Like, yeah, I was there on opening day of McDonald's. Oh, you haven't heard of McDonald's? Where have, where have you been? You know what I mean? That's what a lot of that would have been. And it's a, it's an it's it's an amazing part of history, a really interesting part of history, especially here at the context of the Cold War. And it's not as, you know, you don't get that kind of hype today when a new brand comes in nearly as much, but I don't know if anything's going to top that with, with McDonald's of something new entering a place and becoming already before it even launches, having this like hype, anticipation you, I, I, you know i think this mcdonald's opening in moscow is about the biggest i can think of if you have any other things that are like that of this type of anticipation and response early on by something new coming into your 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 community i don't know get talk about it uh, uh let me know in the comments of what you thought there so all right well this was great and yeah actually it has a lot of historical value especially when you're talking about that early part of the late the late cold war um happening there so uh, it's pretty cool um for something you can talk about as evidence of of the cold war and things like that so all right very 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 cool really like this um we'll see if this channel's got some other stuff kind of like this because that could be very interesting very cool i don't know what else kind of what other kind of things they do but uh um, it was pretty awesome. So I really like this. All right. If you like this link to it is down below. Um, make sure you click on it. Okay. And, uh, you know, if you like this, just click on it, even if it's just clicking on it, give them the view, that kind of thing, sub to the channel, give it a like, it really helps the channels out. And without those, we don't have our channel here and, uh, being able to, to be able to discuss it and, and, and that kind of things and promote it. So definitely make sure to do that. Um, if you would like to get involved in this conversation too, about this stuff, uh, uh definitely join our discord server down below is a link to that. You can go join that and the good 5,000 plus people that we have, um, over there talking about all kinds of historical subjects, enable notifications, um, click that bell so you can come hang out with us in live premieres and, uh, know when new videos come out and all that kind of stuff. And thank you to everyone that's been supporting the channel a lot of ways, uh, patron pledgers, channel members, that kind of thing. Thank you. But thank you just, uh, for being here and being a part of the history community and making sure it's a prevalent part, an important part here of this corner of the internet. All right. With that, we'll see you guys next time. Bye.